Bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et à tous, ou à tous, comme on dit maintenant, avec un langage plus euh, inclusif. Uh, welcome everybody. En anglais, c'est toujours plus facile d'être inclusif. Je me présente, je suis Christian Baron, vice à la recherche et au développement de la Faculté de médecine de l'Université de Montréal. J'ai le plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour la tenue de la conférence Gardner, édition 2019. Les conférences de prestige de cette fondation sont toujours un événement assez remarquable et ça pour cause depuis 1959. La fondation Gardner des pistes à travers le monde des chercheurs du domaine médical dont les découvertes contribuent à transformer la façon dont la médecine est pratiquée et donc à améliorer à le plus long terme la vie humaine. Elle est le seul organisme canadien qui octroie des prix internationaux d'un pareil rayonnement. Dans les faits, le prix Gardner figure parmi les trois plus prestigieux prix du domaine biomédical du monde, donc le Nobel, le Lasker, si je ne me trompe pas, et ensuite c'est le Gardner, et ça c'est un prix canadien. In this fashion, the foundation and its awards valorize scientific discovery in general and scientists from around the world, being an important vehicle for the outreach of Canada across the world and an important contributor to the scientific culture in our own country. The foundation makes the following annual awards. The Canada Gardner International Awards, uh, giving to biomedical scientists who have made original contributions to medicine, reducing an increased understanding of human biology and disease. And Dr. Diffley has, in fact, uh, received one of these awards or will receive them later this week. Canada Gardner, there's the second category is the Canada Gardner Global Health Award. This award is given to a scientist whose advances have or will potentially have a significant impact on health outcomes in the developing world. And finally, last but not, last not, least, but not least, there's a Canada Gardner Reitman Award. It's given to a Canadian who has de demonstrated outstanding leadership in medicine and medical science. On sait que la Fondation Gardner a doué d'une remarquable fleur pour repérer l'excellence et elle l'a démontré à plusieurs reprises au fil des dernières années. Cette dernière décennie, seulement une vingtaine de prix Nobel en médecine avaient auparavant reçu un prix Canada Gardner. Donc c'est une bonne façon, un outil de prévision. Par ailleurs, le programme National Gardner, celui dont nous bénéficions aujourd'hui même, rejoint des étudiants partout au pays, dans une vingtaine de villes canadiennes. Et ici à Montréal, Dr. Defley a visité McGill hier, UDM aujourd'hui. Il sera à Concordia demain. Nous avons vu visiter le Collège Brébeuf ce midi, toujours une, très, très plaisant de présenter pour les, pour les étudiants au collège. Ce programme qui permet un contact avec les grands scientifiques qui sont les lauréats de prix Gardner poursuit un double objectif. Non seulement inspirer la prochaine génération de chercheurs, en particulier dans les sciences de la santé, mais aussi valoriser l'activité scientifique en général. Et comme vous savez, comme vous savez tous, la science ne peut être que plus importante à l'avenir avec toutes les fake news et les choses qu'on vit au quotidien dans notre monde. Il s'agit de là d'un programme tout à fait unique de Saint Jean. Uh, Dr. Diffley, thanks, thanks so much for coming and for presenting your science to us today. And I would like to thank also different partners, particularly, of course, the Gerner Foundation for the generous support year after year, without whom this event would really not happen. Enfin, je veux remercier tous et toutes de votre présence et nous vous souhaite une excellente conférence. Thanks to you all for coming. I wish you a stimulating conference. And with that, I pass the floor to Dr. Marie-Josée Hébert, our vice-rectrice at the research, at the discovery, at the creation, and at the innovation. Thank you. Dear invités, dear colleagues, and dear Professor De Fleet, pleasure to have you here. And the honor me revient to you present. So I'll do that in French. Um, but I promise that I will tell the truth and only nothing but the truth about your many accomplishments. <laughs> so uh, I will be on close watch. Alors, comme vous le savez, John Duffley is lauréat 2019 uh, du Prix International Canada Gardner pour ses recherches pionnières sur les mécanismes qui régissent la réplication de l'ADN la chez les eucaryotes. Il a d'abord utilisé la levure, puis des cellules humaines et a combiné les approches génétiques et biochimiques pour euh, décoder ce phénomène de régulation critique dont la précision est essentielle pour maintenir la stabilité génomique des cellules. Alors, il a fait ses études à l'Université de New York, où il a obtenu son doctorat en 1985, 1985? 
PhD studies? New York? Indeed. Et puis là, après ça, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, dans l'équipe de Bruce Tillman qui était lui-même lauréat du prix Gardner cette année-là, « So it stays in the family ». Puis, il s'envole pour Londres, 90. Et c'est là qu'il s'installe et forme son équipe au Clare Hall Laboratories, dont il devient le directeur en 2006. Et la même année, il est nommé directeur du London Research Institute. Depuis 2015, il est directeur de recherche associé du Francis Crick Institute. Alors, avec son groupe, John Duffley a étudié dans le détail les mécanismes moléculaires grâce auxquels le génome est reproduit à l'identique d'une cellule mère, à partir d'une cellule mère. Et pour une cellule humaine, vous le savez tous très, très bien que ce processus implique que plus d'un milliard de paires de bases soient fidèlement copiées à chaque division dans le cadre d'un processus qui est or orchestré rigoureusement. Et... Il a donc porté son attention sur ce qu'on appelle les origines de réplication. Et à la fin des années 80, il a isolé la première protéine connue pour s'y fixer, ABF1, Autonomous Replicating Sequences Binding Factor. Puis, en 1992, son laboratoire a contribué à la description de ORC, Origin Replication Complex, dont l'intervention est requise pour enclencher le processus. Et depuis lors, son équipe a découvert et caractérisé plusieurs autres protéines requises à ce stade, dont celles constituant le complexe pré-réplicatif, lui-même recruté par le complexe ORC. Il a collaboré aux travaux ayant démontré que les kinases, dépendantes des cyclines, agissaient à la manière de commutateur en activant ou en bloquant la transition entre les différentes phases du cycle cellulaire. Et bien sûr, on le comprend tous que toute erreur dans la réplication de ce système complexe peut conduire à une instabilité génomique qui est elle-même particulièrement importante dans le domaine de l'oncologie. Et on comprend que les implications des recherches de John Defley ont été particulièrement importantes dans le domaine de la biologie du cancer. Donc, de fil en aiguille, lui et son équipe sont arrivés, entre autres, à expliquer l'influence de la chromatine sur le choix de l'origine de réplication, à documenter le mode d'activation et le rôle de différentes enzymes, ainsi qu'à décrire le balai des nucléosomes sur l'ADN naissant. Alors, la quête de John Diffley ne s'arrête pas là. Il entend en effet pousser l'exploration biochimique pour mieux comprendre comment la réplication de l'ADN interagit avec de nombreux processus nucléaires, y compris la transmission épigénétique, la cohésion des chromosomes et la, répar la réparation post-réplication. Alors, j'ai déjà trop parlé, mais il y en avait trop à dire. Le prix... Euh, donc, Gardner s'ajoute à une liste d'honneurs qui est déjà longue, puisque vous avez déjà remporté en 2016 le prix européen Louis Janet, le prix Paul Marx pour la recherche sur le cancer. Vous êtes membre de l'Organisation européenne de biologie moléculaire, de la Royal Society, de l'American Association for the Advancements of Science, etc., etc. Et donc, je m'arrête en vous disant qu'on behalf of our community, allow me to warmly congratulate you for the Gardner International Award and for your great, immense contributions to biology. You are an inspiring figure for generations of scientists. Thank you very much for being with us today. La parole est à vous. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, it sounded great. <laughs> um, So hey, I just want to thank everybody at the university here for a, a great day. It's been, uh, you've been very welcoming and I've had a lovely time and it's great to see our old friends here in the front row. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, and it, I guess I'd really like to thank the Gairdner Foundation for um, making the mistake of giving me this prize. Um, so thank you and please take that back to uh, the Gairdner. Okay, so... Um, So I'm giving so today's talk is kind of an overview talk of what we've been doing and how we got here. If you know, if people want to discuss things in more depth at any point, I'm really super happy to do it. But let's just get through this bit. So um, this is a, a slide I, I used to, to sort of facetiously demonstrate the fact that human beings are all incredibly similar to each other. Um, there are eight billion people on Earth, and we're all within a half a percent of, of our, our DNA uh, from each other. And so, um, you know, this is sort of one indication of genomic stability. Um, and of course, uh, 
Uh, we can see that in familial things here. I, I, I've had fun this last week with talking to PhD students, uh, talking to high school students and asking them if they knew who John Lennon was. And extraordinarily, they all do, which I think is really a great sign for the future. Um, so this is just a picture of John Yoko, uh, John Yoko and their son, Sean, and just makes the point that, you know, uh, the germline inheritance is very strong. Uh, we end up uh, looking very much like the parents, but of course, uh, that's a germline thing. Um, but um, in fact, every cell in your body has the complete blueprint of DNA to make another one of you. This is, of course, Dolly the sheep. Um, and we have a lot of cells in our body, uh, and we make a lot of DNA. So I'm going to show you a couple of numbers here that I always find uh, extraordinary. Uh, you probably have seen this thing that there are two meters of DNA uh, in each one of your cells. If you took the DNA and laid it out end to end, it would be about two meters. We have a lot of cells. And it turns out that if you do some very simple back of the envelope calculations, you can pretty easily figure out that during the course of your life, you synthesize probably several light years of DNA. Now, if you think about what that means, you know, light year is the distance that light travels in a year, and light is very fast. Um, so that's an awful lot of DNA, and to put that in perspective, during the course of this seminar, you'll each synthesize about 20 billion meters of DNA. Right, so that is a lot of DNA. What's more extraordinary uh, is that we know that mutations in large numbers of genes can cause cancer, but two-thirds of us won't get cancer. In cancer charities, we tend to focus on the fact that a third of us will get cancer, but I think it's quite remarkable that two-thirds of us won't. Uh, and it's a real testament to the um, quality control mechanisms that ensure that DNA replication is incredibly accurate. Um, this is a, a slide that really is just here to remind me. This is a mitotic scanning electron micrograph of a mitotic chromosome. You can see the two sister chromatids held together at the centromere here. And it, 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 I, I use it to remind me to say that not only do, does the DNA have to replicate during S phase, but actually all the proteins that are associated with the DNA also have to be duplicated and put in the correct place during uh, replication. So it's a, it's a really, a, it's an incredible process. Uh, the flip side of this is that um, cancer cell, uh, almost all cancer cells are characterized by a very, very high level of genomic instability. This is a spectral karyotype uh, on the top of wild type diploid cell, a normal diploid cell, and then below it are six, uh, six different uh, colorectal cancers. And you don't have to be an expert in cytogenetics to realize that uh, they have completely uh, messed up genomes. They have different copy numbers of chromosomes. And if you look carefully at some of them, you'll see that many of the chromosomes have more than one color in them, which means that they've been uh, translocated with, between different chromosomes. So cancers almost universally have very high levels of genetic variability and unstable genomes. And what we're starting to really realize now is that this is incredibly important because it fuels tumor evolution. It provides the variation, uh, the variability, that then evolution can work on and drive things like metastasis and drug resistance. So this is, it's a really important thing. And so our approach really is to try and understand the, the first slide, how, how genomes are normally really stably maintained so that hopefully we can understand how this control gets lost in cancer cells. What I'm really going to talk about today is normal replication, but I'd be happy to talk about uh, what happens in cancer as well. Okay, so now we go back to uh, Leninger uh, 101. This is the basics of DNA replication. I'm not going to ask you to learn a lot of different enzymes. It's those two enzymes that matter. Uh, the first is the DNA helicase that unwinds the DNA, exposes the bases in the middle of the DNA, and the second is a DNA polymerase that copies the DNA. So pretty straightforward, two enzymes, uh, and I also like to use this slide to just point out that because DNA is anti-parallel and because DNA polymerases can only go in a five prime to three prime direction, uh, the two strands get replicated in, different, in, in a different way. The uh, leading strand, which is this one here on the right, uh, 
uh, gets synthesized continuously because that DNA polymerase can go in the same direction as the HeLa case, uh, but the other strand gets synthesized discontinuously in short little fragments called Okazaki fragments that, that get stitched together after, uh, after the replication fork passes. So uh, DNA unwinding, DNA synthesis have to be coupled because you don't want to unwind lots of DNA because single strands DNA is very uh, susceptible to DNA damage. So you want to couple DNA synthesis with uh, DNA unwinding. And this is just an example of how this is done in E. coli. It's, uh, it sort of brings up, it brings this point up that that replication happens in this big machine, this replosome. Um, but I think one of the points that um, I think was kind of important in thinking about this many years ago uh, was the realization that evo during evolution, the replication machinery actually evolved twice separately. So there was one path that led to bacteria, and that was the slide that I just showed you. And there was another path that led to archaea and eukaryotes. And the two systems are absolutely completely different. There's almost nothing in common between them. Um, and so although we know a lot about E. coli replication, uh, we felt 30 years ago or more that uh, we really needed to understand how it worked in, in eukaryotes like you and me. So um, this is, uh, when I was a PhD student, this was a picture that I found uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. It's just a electron micrograph of DNA from an early Drosophila embryo. Uh, Drosophila have very, sh uh, in the beginning after fertilization, they go through multiple very, very fast rounds of, of, of replication and mitosis to generate a lot of cells. The cell cycle, the whole cell cycle is only about five minutes, five or six minutes, and replication happens in about three or four minutes. Um, and so this is a bit of DNA from a Drosophila embryo. And what you can see, probably easiest if you look at the little scan, the trace down at the bottom, uh, is the presence of these bubbles in the DNA as you go along. And of course, each one of those bubbles is uh, a replication bubble. So it's two replication forks moving away from each other, replicating uh, the DNA as they go along. And so the slide makes a couple of points. Um, but I, I like to show it because it was very inspirational to me because uh, this, little, this little bubble right down here uh, was my favorite one because it's a little one. Uh, and it made me think that, you know, I really wanted to know what was going on at the middle of that bubble just the second before it started, you know, thinking about what was, what was actually driving replication to start at that particular site. So to put that in a slightly more diagrammatic way here, uh, eukaryotic genomes are replicated from multiple replication origins. This is very different from bacteria, which have single replication origins. And this actually was really important probably in eukaryotic evolution because it means that the length of time it takes to replicate your genome is actually not proportional to the size of your genome. It's only proportional to a first approximation to the distance between the origins. So if you have lots of origins that are very close together, you can replicate your genome very quickly, as in the Drosophila case, for example. Um, and so this was probably the development of this system in evolution was probably very important in allowing genome sizes to expand uh, and allowing then uh, complexity of, of organisms to increase. Of course, um, in most cells, it, and you could see it in that pic picture from Drosophila, the, the, the bubbles aren't all the same size, which, which means that they didn't all initiate at the same time. And in fact, most cells have a temporal program for origin firing. So some origins get activated at the beginning of S phase, others get activated in the middle, others get activated late in S phase. And this kind of helps illustrate what was really the kind the the what I thought was the most interesting question about replication when I first started out. And that is, how does, at this point in S phase, after some origins have fired and some haven't, how does the cell know to fire that late origin and not reinitiate replication from the early origins that have already fired? Because if it were to reinitiate replication from an early origin, you'd get extra copies of some DNA sequences and uh, that would lead to genome instability and all sorts of terrible things. 
And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this first half of the talk is, is really how the cell ensures that it never reinitiates replication from a replication origin. So when we started this back uh, in the 1980s, uh, we had really one tool, uh, and that was the discovery of replication origins in the Davis and uh, Carbon labs. Um, and these were identified, oh sorry, these were identified as sequences that will, would allow plasmids to be maintained autonomously, that's called autonomously replicating sequences. They turn out to be genetically required for replication and biochemically the sites where replication begins. Um, there was then a lot of work on uh, trying to understand what was important for these sequences, and this is an example from uh, York Morarens and Bruce Stillman, where they took one of these origins, called ARS1, and they made linker substitution mutations across the entire sequence, and they looked at origin function by measuring plasmid stability. And you can see, for example, uh, that if you make linker substitutions in this A domain, you completely lose origin function, uh, but then some of these other domains, uh, when you knock them out, then origin function is, is greatly reduced. So this identified several sequence elements within the origin that were important for function. So we sort of had that with us. And um, we, uh, I, when I started my own lab in, in, uh, in Clare Hall, decided that uh, one of the problems that we were having was we didn't really understand what was happening at replication origins uh, during the cell cycle. So we needed to have some kind of a, uh, an understanding of what was going on at these DNA sequences throughout the cell cycle. And this was before CHIP was invented. So we didn't have CHIP, and CHIP would have been pretty useless because we didn't have any genes that we could CHIP at that point, really, not many. Uh, and so we took a slightly different approach, which was to use this technique called genomic footprinting, which we sort of developed. And the idea is that uh, you lyse cells and you treat them with a, a nonspecific nuclease like DNAs1, and you get a pattern of cleavage uh, on that DNA if it's naked DNA. But if a, if a particular sequence element is covered by a protein, it gets protected from cleavage. Um, and of course, you can look at changes in that through the cell cycle and see if there are different regions that get protected. Um, and then you can read all of this out on a sequencing gel. So we did a lot of this, um, and I'm not going to show you any of the, the data because they're a little bit hard to look at, but just say work from us doing that as well as the list of labs that are on this slide and probably many others led to the following view of how replication worked. And this was sort of the end of the 1990s view of how it worked, mostly based on these kinds of approaches. That was uh, the following, so that there was this protein called ORC, the origin recognition complex. It's a sequence-specific DNA binding protein in yeast, not in human cells. ORC exists in human cells, but it doesn't seem to bind sequences very specifically. Still a point of some controversy. Uh, and then there were some additional factors, CDC6 and CDT1, that were required to somehow load this protein called MCM onto DNA. We didn't really know what that meant. Um, and that that complex, which we called the pre-replicative complex, or pre-RC, was present at origins throughout G1 phase. And then when cells entered S phase, this was somehow converted into an active, rep two active replication forks. What was really key in understanding this, though, was to understand the role of protein kinases in regulating this process. Because what we found was that um, there's a key protein kinase called cyclin-dependent kinase. I'll say a little bit more about this. Uh, but it has two roles in regulating replication. On the one hand, it's absolutely essential to convert the pre-RC into, active, into active replication forks. But at the same time, it inhibited the assembly of the pre-RC. And if I were to draw a metabolic pathway and say that we've got something that both inhibits and activates it, you'd look at me like I was crazy because it would be the stupidest way to design a system. And it would be stupid if it weren't for the fact that cyclin-dependent kinase levels change during the cell cycle. And that turns out to be the key because cyclin-dependent kinases 
have to be inactivated in order to get out of mitosis. So if you make an un indestructible cyclin, cells are rest in, in mitosis and they don't come out. So you have to inactivate CDK in order to get into G1 phase. And so that opens up a window of time when cyclin-dependent kinase activity is low. And it's during that period that MCM gets loaded onto DNA. Then as cells go into S phase, they reactivate CDK. Uh, and that does two things. One is it allows uh, the pre-RCs that are already loaded to become activated, but then at the same time, it prevents the reloading of new pre-RCs onto origins that have already fired. And this is the basic logic behind how you can have 100,000 replication origins in your genome, and they can all be activated no more than once in a cell cycle. So if you get nothing else out of this talk, that's probably the most important thing. Okay, so that's sort of where we were at the end of the 1990s. Uh, and then we uh, decided that, you know, we could only get so far with genetics and cell biology, and that if we really wanted to understand the mechanism of replication, uh, we had to take a leaf out of Richard Feynman's book, or more accurately, his, his blackboard. And you can see here he had written on his blackboard in Caltech, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And of course, as a biochemist, what we take that to mean is we need to be able to reconstitute replication from its constituent parts, which is DNA and proteins. Uh, we also uh, were keen on Ephraim Racker's uh, little proverb, don't waste clean thinking on dirty enzymes. So the idea is not to use extracts, but to use purified proteins so that we would know exactly what was going into every reaction. And we knew from the work that we'd done in vivo that this would have to be a sequential reaction. It would have to be two steps. We'd have to first load the MCMs onto DNA, and then we'd have to activate them. And so that's what we did. And this was uh, initially, Takashi Seki was the first brave person, so I always have to show his face here because this was a very difficult long-term project, and Takashi started it. Dirk Remus was ultimately the person who reconstituted the MCM loading with purified proteins, and um, I think I had some animations here, they'll probably be gone. Uh, but basically what we do is we purify ORC, CDC6, and the MCM complex, which comes uh, along with the CDT1 protein. We can mix them together on DNA, you see if it wasn't, if it was the original thing, you'd see them moving toward the origin, but it's, it's okay, you've not missed much. Um, and then we can uh, look at the proteins that are bound to the DNA by either silver staining or immunoblotting. And this is an example of one of these uh, reactions. And I won't go through this in a lot of detail except to say that uh, you can probably see in this last lane, oops, sorry, in this, these, this pair of lanes here, um, that in the presence of ATP, uh, you end up with the MCM proteins bound to DNA in a way that's stable to even a high salt extraction. So you can take the reactions and you can add half molar sodium chloride. It removes all the other proteins from the DNA, but the MCM proteins are left behind. And that actually requires ATV hydrolysis because if you use a non-hydrolyzable analog, you don't get that formed. And that allowed us to do some preliminary structural analysis on that loaded MCM. And uh, when we did, we saw these very beautiful uh, double hexamers of MCMs on DNA. And this is a low-resolution EM that we got back in 2009. Uh, and now there's a higher-resolution structure from Big Ties Lab. You can see it's a, it looks very, very similar, but it's a, a higher-resolution picture. And one of the things we learned from this structure, which was kind of interesting, uh, came from even lower resolution EM where we uh, metal shadowed it so that we could see the path of the DNA. And what we saw was that the DNA appeared to go through the long axis of this double hexamer. And then we did some experiments to look biochemically at the binding and it turns out, uh, well, I'll just show you this experiment which is kind of a nice experiment. So what we did here was we took MCMs that were loaded on DNA, DNA is attached to magnetic beads, and we simply asked, how long do the MCMs remain bound to DNA? And what you can see is here, this curve where it's going down with time, this is what happens on linear, if the DNA is linear. And it happens plus or minus ATP, so it's ATP independent. 
However, if you do the same experiment and you use a circular DNA attached to, uh, to the beads, then what you see is the MCMs really never come off the DNA. And we interpret this uh, as meaning that the MCMs can actually slide on the DNA. Um, and that kind of led us at the time to propose this idea that the uh, double-stranded DNA was passing through this central channel uh, and that the MCMs were topologically bound to the DNA but not necessarily physically tightly bound to the DNA. So it was a, mostly a topological binding. And uh, gratifyingly, two years ago now, we got a high-resolution structure uh, along with our colleague Alessandro Costa of uh, the double hexamer bound to double-stranded DNA. And you can see, I think, in this cutaway on the right, that uh, double-strand DNA passes through this central channel of the DNA as we, as we thought it would. Okay, and just to point out, because it'll become a little relevant in a few slides, that, that the double hexamer covers about 65, 62 to 65 base pairs of DNA. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the one thing that that sort of um, made us start to think about is that, well, okay, the double hexamer is a, double hexamer is a symmetrical structure. Um, it's a head-to-head -head double hexamer. Um, but the loader that we knew about, ORC, was bound at a single binding site, which was this A and B1 element of, of RS1, which I showed you in that linker substitution experiment. So we became very interested in the question of how you generate symmetry from something that's not symmetrical. And we realized, actually, that and this was something that had been noticed in the 1980s, that um, it turned out that the B2 element, one of these other functional elements in the, uh, in, in the origin, is also potentially an ORC binding site. And in fact, in the very first paper describing ORC by Steve Bell and Bruce Stillman, they showed that if they knocked out the A, if they knocked out the A element, ORC would bind to the B2 element. So they were sort of mutually exclusive binding with A being the dominant binding. So that was interesting, and that led us to start to think about how we could test the idea that you needed two ORC binding sites to uh, make an origin. So we decided to abandon the idea of looking at natural origins because they're very complicated and you never know exactly what you're getting, and to start to build a, an origin synthetically just using uh, DNA sequence that we could define. And so we took a GC-rich piece of DNA, which is not very good as an origin in any kind of a system, and we embedded into that uh, ORC binding sites, which are these green arrows, and we used them to measure MCM, and then we measured MCM loading on these different things. And I think what you can see is that uh, the single sites are very inefficient at loading MCM, uh, and the double sites are very inefficient, but particularly when you have two ORC binding sites facing each other, you uh, get very efficient MCM loading. And we were then able to go and take that and ask, well, what do you need for origin function in vivo using that very same assay that Davis and, and Carbon used uh, 30 years ago? Um, and this is an example of such an assay. So you can see ARS1, which is the classic natural origin, gives you colonies when you do a transformation. Uh, none of the single ORC binding sites do. Uh, and when we look at the two ORC binding sites, it's only when we have the two binding sites facing each other that we get uh, origin function. So this kind of tells us that uh, what a replication origin is is simply two ORC binding sites facing each other. You don't need anything more complicated than that. You don't need DNA unwinding elements. You don't need any of the other things that have been implicated in replication. You just need two ORC binding sites. Um, but interestingly, it turns out that the distance between those two ORC binding sites can be very flexible. So they can be as close together as 25 base pairs or as far apart as 400 base pairs, and you still see uh, uh, synergistic MCM loading. You see there's a peak at about 70 base pairs, uh, and that's, we think, probably because 65 base pairs is the amount of DNA that the double hexamer covers, and so that would fit nicely between the two ORC binding sites. Uh, but it really implies that you can get ORC uh, loading, uh, MCM loading at, at all sorts of distances. And I should say all of these things are functional origins in vivo as well. So uh, there's lots of things I could say about this, and I, I'll leave it to try and finish on time. 
But I just wanted to make the point that, um, so what we think in budding yeast replication origins are is a high affinity orc binding site flanked by multiple low affinity binding sites in the opposite orientation. Interestingly, it turns out in archaea, and remember I said that the uh, replication system different in bacteria, but similar in the line that leads to archaea and eukaryotes. So archaea have a sort of simplified version of, of the replication system. And it turns out that in their origins, they have two orc binding sites separated by 65 base pairs, and they're two high affinity binding sites. So we think our synthetic origin has sort of just recreated the archaea origin. I mentioned that ORC is not a very good sequence-specific DNA binding protein when isolated from the human ORC. Uh, and so we imagine uh, that in vertebrates, that ORC will be less sequence-specific, uh, but that the same kind of principle will probably uh, be involved in, in MCM loading. So that's a little bit about how the MCM uh, helicase, how the MCM complex gets loaded. Um, and now uh, what I wanted to turn to next is, is the question of how the helicase gets activated. Uh, and this was a very big project. This, the, the MCM loading just required three purified proteins, but this next step was really quite complicated to reconstitute. Um, and I think Joe Yields on the top left there was the person who really led this project, but everybody else on the slide made really important contributions to it. And as I said, it involved the purification of a lot of different proteins. And in order to purify this a lot of different proteins, we had to develop a kind of a pipeline for protein expression and purification. Uh, and at this point now, I think we've purified something like 50, 50 or 60 different proteins this way. And we, we are very good at purifying proteins. Um, and so what we then did was to do what the cell does. So we first loaded the helicase in the absence of CDK activity, and then we added all these additional firing factors uh, to activate the helicase and monitor replication by the incorporation of a radio-labeled precursor. And uh, very uh, gratifyingly, we were able to get replication to work in this system. This is a very stripped-down replication system. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but you can see that there are these two smears of DNA in the uh, complete reaction. One of them turns out to correspond to leading strand replication. That's the continuous strand. And then the small one at the bottom is the Okazaki fragments, the lagging strand replication. And very nicely, it required the two protein kinases that we knew were required in vivo. And probably more importantly, if we put CDK in before MCM loading, it blocked replication. So it was recapitulating both of the CDK functions in replication. So that allowed us to then ask how the helicase gets activated. And this was work from Max Douglas, who's a great postdoc in my lab, uh, together with Alessandro Costa's lab and, and a student for us, Abid Ali, in his lab. And I just wanted to sort of make a point about uh, what the problem here was. So the double hexamer, the MCM double hexamer is bound around double-stranded DNA. It's topologically bound around double-stranded DNA. But all helicases work by being bound around single-stranded DNA, usually topologically, um, and translocating along single-stranded DNA. So if you think about what that means, it means that the MCM hexamer has to somehow melt the DNA inside the ring, somehow start the denaturation process. Then it has to somehow open the ring, extrude one strand, and reclose around the correct single strand. So that is a, a super complicated reaction. We still don't understand it completely, but I can show you what we do understand about it. So uh, I sort of briefly mentioned that we need ATP hydrolysis in order to load the double hexamer onto DNA. Uh, what I didn't tell you is that after ATP hydrolysis, first of all, I didn't tell you that it's actually the MCM subunits themselves that have to hydrolyze ATP to load onto the DNA. And I also didn't tell you that once the MCMs are loaded onto the DNA, they remain very stably bound to ADP. So they hydrolyze ATP during the loading and they hold on to that ADP product. Um, so then the next thing that happens is that the two protein kinases, cyclin-dependent kinase and this other kinase, which I haven't really talked about, DBF4-dependent kinase, do their business. And what these kinases do 
in the simplest way is they, they simply make binding sites for some of these firing factor proteins to allow the, the generation of, a, of a, a mega complex of proteins on the MCMs. Um, and that mega complex uh, triggers the release of ADP, and that's important in this whole process. Now, I'll give you a little bit more detail about how the two kinases work. Um, it, we know the substrates for both of them, and it turns out that the substrate for DBF4-dependent kinase is, is two of the subunits in the MCM complex, MCM4 and MCM6, and that generates binding sites for a protein called SLD3, and I'll say a little bit more about SLD3 in a minute. But SLD3's role is to bring in this protein called CDC45. The active helicase we call CMG for CDC45 MCM GINs. So it's going to bring in CDC, we have to bring in CDC45 and GINs. And so this first step brings in CDC45. <clears throat> I'll skip over that. Cyclin-dependent kinase then phosphorylates two proteins, and they're SLD2 and SLD3. And the phosphorylation of those two proteins generates binding sites for BRCT repeats in the DPB11 protein. So what DPB11 does is it pulls in SLD2 from solution uh, into this complex of SLD3 bound to the MCM complex. And so now we get all of these proteins in together. And what SLD2 does then is it brings in two proteins that are key. One is GINs, that's the third component that we need to make the active helicase, and it brings in the leading strand DNA polymerase, polymerase epsilon, which is absolutely required, interestingly, for the activation of the helicase, as well as being required for leading strand replication. I'll skip over that. Okay, so that's sort of how you get to this point of you having all of the proteins in and being ready to activate the helicase. The helicase isn't active at this point. What has to happen next, though, is that ATP has to rebind to this double hexamer. And it's the binding, it's the binding of ATP that generates a massive conformational change in this whole complex. It causes the dissociation of the double hexamer into two single hexamers. It causes the stable association of, CD, of, of CDC45 and GIN. So now we have, for the first time, a stable CMG complex. And it also generates the first DNA melting. So we get about seven base pairs of melted DNA in each hexamer. So this now we understand fairly well, and we're working with Alessandra Costa's lab to get some structural information on all of these steps, which will be very interesting. The next step is a bit of a magic step and we don't understand this step at all. It requires one additional protein called MCM10, and it requires ATP hydrolysis, and this is the step that converts this partially active uh, CMG, which is not yet bound completely around single-stranded DNA, into a fully active CMG helicase. So something between, in this last step, must involve reopening of the MCM ring and extrusion of, of one strand. And this is something we're very interested in trying to understand. And I'll just end this part with uh, what was one last mystery about this, which concerned the direction of the helicase. So we knew, uh, we knew that the helicase went three prime to five prime. That's not so useful. What we didn't know was whether the two helicases go away from each other at initiation, and I have to say initially this was my prejudice, uh, or whether now that they're bound around single-stranded DNA, they go toward each other and actually pass each other in the origin. And we realized that we could answer that question with EM uh, by putting roadblocks on the DNA and running the helicase into a roadblock and looking at the blocked helicase by EM. And we had enough structural information that we could tell the front from the back of the helicase. And so the way we actually did this in practice was to, um, to, put a, uh, to block the end of a linear DNA and then to load an excess of MCM double hexamers. Remember, they can slide on DNA and to activate a small subset of them so that we would drive the helicase into these double hexamers, they'd hit the roadblock, and then that would stop. In fact, that's where we see these beautiful uh, trains of double hexamers by uh, EM. And we got a lot of these, and then we were able to do some 2D class averages and unambiguously uh, show that it's the end terminus of the MCM helicase that's at the front 
And what that means uh, is that after generating the active CMG, the two helicases have to pass each other in the origin uh, and, and go in, in opposite directions. So this was not our initial prejudice, but it turns out to be the way it works. And upon mature reflection, uh, we sort of realized that this has some advantages because um, what it does is it gives you a fail-safe way of making sure that both hexamers are active. If only one of them is active, then it can't get past the other one. Uh, and it also has some implications that I won't go into about how, uh, how the leaving strand replication is established because it turns out it's the Okazaki fragment from, first Okazaki fragment from the leftward helicase that generates the leading strand for the rightward moving replication fork. Uh, and that's much easier if you do it this way. So then we spent, uh, you know, some time trying to optimize replication. What I showed you, the replication I showed you before was very slow and, and in, incomplete. We realized there were factors missing. Uh, and so we purified a whole bunch of additional factors and we're ultimately able to get replication rates that were very that were basically what happens in vivo. In fact, they're at the high end of the in vivo replication rates on naked DNA. So it's about, the average is, is about one and a half kilobases per minute in vivo. So we're getting fast replication. We're getting balanced leading and lagging strand replication, which I won't show you. Um, and that's great. So what I want to leave you with in the last five, 10 minutes is really kind of a direction of travel of what we're really interested in in the future. So obviously having this in vitro replication system gives us a great tool for really understanding the mechanism of replication, for understanding uh, you know, the structures that are involved, and we're doing a lot of that. Um, but it also gives us another opportunity, which is to start to think about all of the processes that are associated with DNA replication. So because replication has to cover the entire genome, it's got to deal with everything that's happening in the genome. So it's got to deal with gene expression. It's got to deal with RNA polymerase. It's crucial for things like sister chromatid cohesion. Um, it's important for telomere maintenance. There's all sorts of things that we can start to think about with this, but I thought I'd leave you just with a bit of work we've been doing trying to uh, think about chromatin assembly. And the, the reason that this has always been very interesting to me is that um, somehow during replication, uh, marked histones in nucleosomes have to be transferred from where they are in the parental DNA to the same position in the nascent DNA in order to get anything resembling epigenetic inheritance. This is really, in my view, the kind of essence of what epigenetic inheritance is. It's, 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 a, it's a system by which nucleosomes are dissociated and passed behind the replication fork without being released into solution and mixing with, uh, with uh, newly synthesized histones and things like that. And so this is ultimately one of the things we'd really like to understand mechanistically. <clears throat> so I'm sure I don't need to say much about what chromatin is here. Beads on a string, these fantastic uh, nu nucleosome structures with the histones on the inside and DNA wrapped around on the outside. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that uh, histones are incredibly positively charged and DNA is incredibly negatively charged. So these are very, very stable structures, nucleosomes, and that really does present the replosome with the problem because they've got to be able to get through these stable replosomes. And so to begin to understand this, uh, we decided to try and reconstitute chromatin in vitro. And the way that we do this is we use uh, naive histones. So these are made in E. coli. There are no marks on them at all no tags on them, uh, and we use a couple of uh, a chaperone and a, a, a nucleosome remodeler to generate nucleosome arrays, and I probably don't need to also explain micrococcal nuclease digests to this lab, but micrococcal nuclease cleaves in between nucleosomes, and so if you do a partial micrococcal nuclease digestion, you get this beautiful ladder of, um, of nucleosomes, and this, in fact, is an in vitro template that we made, that we routinely make and use in the replication reactions. So the first thing we did was to take this and put it into the purified replication system, and it doesn't work. So the, the, the complete replication system that worked super well on naked DNA really doesn't work on chromatin templates. And it turns out that you need some additional factors to make replication on chromatin work. I think I can skip that. It's not coming out that well. 
Uh, but so we purified a bunch of proteins, and um, when we put these proteins into the replication reactions, now we get replication that is, again, very similar to the rate of replication we see in vivo. And of these proteins that are listed up there, the thing that's really most important is this histone chaperone called FACT. FACT is really critical for this process to work. And in fact, with just FACT, you can do pretty well. But what was sort of really cool about this for us was that when we looked at the nascent DNA, uh, we saw that the nucleosome, the histones from ahead of the replication fork were somehow being transferred to the nascent DNA. Now, this is still something we're not, we're, we're working on. This is, we don't know a lot more about this. Um, but we know the reactions don't have any free histones and they have an excess of DNA. So the implication is that somehow the nucleosomes are being passed from ahead of the fork to behind the fork. And that's really something we're super excited about. Um, now, of course, when you go from making parental DNA into two daughter molecules, you dilute the histones in half. And so you have to have a way of, of reconstituting the complete chromatin. And that involves a second pathway, the de novo pathway for, for uh, chromatin assembly. And this was actually discovered first when I was a postdoc with Bruce Stillman. Uh, back in the 1980s, and they showed that the key factor involved in this is this protein called CAF1, but over the years there have been other proteins that have been implicated in this as well. So we expressed and purified all of these proteins, and to make a long story short, uh, we've been able to reconstitute the de novo uh, pathway as well. So um, this is a very, uh, when Bruce, when I was in Bruce's lab and they does they figured out this assay. I just thought it was so cool. I love explaining it. I love seeing it. So <clears throat> the idea here is that on the bottom of this, you can see an ethidium bromide stain of the total DNA in the reactions. And what you can pretty much see is that the whole gel, they look pretty much the same. So they're just relaxed plasmid DNA. We've got topoisomerases in the reaction. Plasmids just get relaxed. But if you look at the top, this is now the replicated products. And this assay relies on inefficiency. It relies on the fact that only a small fraction of the input molecules get replicated. So you see the bulk in the ethidium bromide. You don't see the replicated molecules by ethidium bromide, but you see them by autoradiography. And what I think you can see on the far right lane is that in the complete reaction, uh, the the major product, aside from the replication intermediates, which are at the top of the gel, the major product is actually a supercoiled plasmid. And that's because it's being assembled into chromatin during replication. I won't show you that. Uh, and this allowed us to then ask what's required for this. And it turns out that both CAF1 and another protein called ASF1 are essential for this uh, de novo pathway. And so that's something we're really interested in doing. And so now what we're trying to do is to take the parental nucleosome pathway, which we see during replication, and combine it with this de novo pathway using differently tagged histones to try and really understand and tease apart how this whole thing works. And hopefully, if I can come back in a few years' time, we'll have some answers about that. Yeah, so I think I can skip that. So I don't think I really had anything else to say, except that um, I've been incredibly fortunate over the years to work with loads of incredibly talented people. I've mentioned some of them as we've gone along the way. This is my current lab. They're amazing. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions as detailed as you want to make them. I, I, I kept it a bit simple during this. But. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Lang Vero. He and I will help co-lead the question and answer period. Et uh, vous êtes bon, bienvenu de poser vos questions en français ou anglais. And I uh, add exactly questions en français. I'll, I'll talk for the... Yeah. And please so. use your mic to... Uh, you go. Hi. <coughs> um, one question. The MCM loading step, is it influenced at all by uh, nucleosomes? Yeah, in so your I did talk about that, but... Um, <coughs> So this, I'm going to step back and say something a little bit broader. One thing I've learned during this whole reconstitution exercise is that um, if you have a, a reaction and uh, it's incredibly sensitive to the concentration of something, 
it almost always means that you're missing something. The system's actually super robust. You can change the levels of things and you don't, you know, if you drop the levels of some of these factors, you might get a bit less replication, but it won't affect the quality of the replication. And this was an example of it. So when we, did, when we do MCM loading on naked DNA, um, we, it's just a very efficient process, um, but it's not very origin dependent. And in fact, uh, you have to really, really kind of play with the salt concentration and the orc concentration to make it dependent on that, uh, that binding, the, the origin. That's because orc is a pretty promiscuous DNA binding protein. But as soon as you put it in chromatin, uh, it becomes completely origin dependent. And we think the reason for that is that um, origins tend to exclude nucleosomes. So they tend to be quite AT rich and they generate a sort of a 150 base pair region where there are no nucleosomes. Um, and so there's nucleosomes on the rest of the DNA that's preventing ORC from binding. So really the only place that MCM loading can happen then is in, in the origin. So then knocking out the origin becomes completely black and white in terms of MCM loading. We don't see a stimulation, so we don't see any, it's a little bit hard to do these experiments in a quantitative way, but we don't see that nucleosomes make loading better. We just see that it makes it more origin specific. Yeah. Is it more structural? It's not, I mean, it depends on the Orc. It's no, it, so um, there's been a lot of work on. No, no, so it, it's just, a, it's a slightly AT rich sequence that it binds to. It binds B form. So there's now a crystal structure of Orc band to DNA. It binds to B form DNA. It, it absolutely requires a specific sequence. Um, we can explain, uh, not my lab, but uh, actually Bruce's lab and Big Tai's lab have nice work showing that the sequence specificity of the yeast protein is conferred by a, a, an alpha helix that's inserted into one of the orc subunits that's not present in human orc, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a sequence specific DNA binding protein, and there's a lot known about all the contacts that are made. Yeah. It, di it distorts the DNA when it binds it, so it, it puts a bend of, of almost. 80 degrees into it, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe. So is human orc then more of a structural specific? So nobody really knows anything about what human orc binds to, except that nobody's been able to find a sequence that it prefers to bind to. And part of that's because the complex is a little bit, the yeast orc complex is sort of like a rock, you can purify it, six subunits always come together, the human orc complex is much less stable. So I think that there's been biochemical problems with it. Of replication. No, you, there's no essential, I mean, obviously you need to make proteins, so you need yeah. transcription, and then it becomes very hard to do the experiment in vivo because many of the proteins are labile and, and so. But certainly in vitro, you don't need any transcription. Uh, and I think in vivo, there's really no evidence that you need transcription. So John, uh, Kim, was, Kim Naismith was here yesterday, as you know, and so it sort of uh, just prompted the, this question, which is, is there um, a relationship, an obvious relationship between um, replication origins and CTCF sites, you know, because there's no. this complicated, you know, problem of, of forming chromatin loops and... Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So no, the short answer is no. The longer answer is that I'm not really so convinced that we know where mammalian replication origins are because the techniques that are used to map them all have flaws associated with them and I think I, it would take me a long time to explain what all the flaws are and all the different techniques, but I think in the next few years what's going to happen is that people who are using all these different mm -hmm. techniques to map origins are going to realize that they have to start looking at each other's data and realize that the, or the real origins are going to be the ones that are positive in all of this, mm -hmm. these uh, approaches. And then maybe we'll have a set of things that we can start to ask those questions with. But so far, there's been no correlation.
with that. And, and the, um, just sort of speaking of origin, um, you know, defining origins and origin strength, those archaeal origins, if you put like, a, you know, two very strong binding sites into those become dominant origins, is there any correlation between the affinity of binding? Are we talking about strength? yeast or in archaea? May, put in, say, put an archaeal one, you know, into a yeast or Right, the binding cell. sites are completely different, so yes. it, it, it oh, okay. doesn't work so that you, way. It, you can't get to work. Um, we've not done the experiment with too high affinity yeast orc binding sites. Um, in vivo, in plasmid assays, they're super good origins. They're as good as any natural origin. Uh, and so it might be interesting to see if they behave differently in um, timing and things like that, but we have not looked at that. <clears throat> um, I was wondering something that's kind of more macro and system. Yep. Uh, I think like we all go into science and medicine with kind of very naive, fresh attitude and you kind of go through this evolution where you become somewhat cynical and then you kind of understand how the system works. And we'll, we'll, I think we all go through that. Um, and something that you said at the, the beginning has kind of triggered this, this question and was you said, you know, a third of people will have cancer. And you said, well, two thirds don't. And I was thinking, you know, some in the, the field of science, we have replication crises which are happening in different fields, whether it's in cancer biology or psychology. And some people say, you know, wow, 30% can only be replicated. But I've heard other th like thought leaders in this, this space saying, my God, 30% is true. So I was wondering, like... Actually, if you can only know which 30%. Yeah, but I was wondering, like, for you personally, what your vision is in general of how this system of science is equilib equilibrating at the moment. Because I just, like, for the Wellcome Trust, for example, they're an institution which are kind of tackling a lot of these issues in different ways. And I was wondering, is it that the system is equi equilibrated at a good point where we have good signal to noise? Or do you feel that there's certain things which definitely need to change about how we the evolution of science and things like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, <clears throat> I think the reproducibility issue is, has gone through a bad phase. Um, I think some of it is rushed to publish things. Uh, and, and I mean, I know from my own experience that if I get a paper to review that involves a lot of complicated genomics, I can't evaluate it, right? I, I can't, as a reviewer, evaluate these kinds of things. And so I, I do feel like a lot of papers that are very heavy genomics, that kind of stuff, are not reviewed as rigorously in the specifics of, of, of the technologies as other papers that are maybe a little easier to understand how, how they're done. Um, I think that'll go away with time as there are more qualified reviewers out there to look at these things. But I, I know I, it's not something we do a lot of, but I know, I mean, maybe Mike should say something about this. But I know that, um, I know that, uh, what do I know? I probably don't know anything. Um, I, I guess, what was I going to say? I think I was going to say, I can't remember what I was going to say, but I, I, I guess I think it'll go, I, some aspect of it'll go away, I guess, as there are more qualified people out there to look at things. I also think science is in, inherently self-correcting, right? And it may sort of piss you off that somebody gets a paper in cell and it's complete crap. But in the long run, it'll just disappear, right? It, it, won't, it won't contribute in the long run to our understanding. It's very hard to buy into that completely, but it is true. Uh, so I get, I mean, I, I'm always incredibly hopeful about science. I think science is, you know, truth. And, and ultimately, if something's not true, it will either be disproven or just ignored. Um, there are all sorts of issues with you know, bad papers, then making other people do experiments that cost money and waste time. And I, there is an issue with that. But I guess my feeling is, you know, we'll get through it. 
you know, I, I think science is, is a constant disequilibrium. That's the way science works. It's never in equilibrium. It's always on the edge. Um, and there's always people pushing things and doing things that are, you know, whatever. It's the nature of the business, and, and I, I think we all have to live with it, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I'll, I'm, com I'm coming back to a nitty-gritty question I, I molecular love nitty -gritty. mechanisms. I love, I love nitty-gritty. Big okay. contrast with the last That's question. Okay. Uh, if I remember this well, so in, uh, forming pre-replicative complexes, you need CDC6 and CDT1 to load MCMs. Now, in, now that you know you have structural information and biochemical assays, is it better understood what these two yeah. proteins yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't talk a lot about this. We've done a lot of uh, structural biology. So one of the things that CDT1 does, which is very nice, is it, it, it comes bound, pre-bound to the MCM complex, and it actually holds the MCM complex open so that the, there's an opening in the ring that the DNA can slot into. So that's a really simple thing, explanation for what CDT1 does. Uh, CDC6 is really part of, is really, I mean, I always thought of it as the seventh ORC subunit. It, it's, it's, ORC is six subunits, five of them are AAA plus ATPases. CDC6 is like the sixth ATPase. Uh, it's the thing that completes the ring. Um, and it, uh, it is required to recruit the MCM complex to DNA. So that first recruitment of the MCM complex is somehow is done by the interface between CDC6 and ORC1. I think we understand a lot of that pretty well. The one thing we don't understand is what hy ATP hydrolysis by ORC is, and CDC6 are actually doing. They don't seem to be required for MCM loading, but they seem to be required for viability. Uh, so it must be important, whatever it is it's doing. And that's something we're kind of interested in. So we get, I think the structural biology especially has been really useful in understanding <laughs> what those proteins are doing. Can you use the mic? Oh, this, use the mic for people who are watching okay. outside the room. So the, the question was, how can you uh, sort of square the idea that on the one hand, the MCM double hexamer is incredibly stable to salt, on the other hand, it slides around? And I think the answer is very simply that it's a very stable ring. So, so salt can't break the ring open, uh, and the ring is bound around DNA. So it's a topological interaction. Um, Inside the ring, uh, there's quite a lot of positively charged amino acids that are, bi that are interacting with the, with the phosphodiester backbone. That actually prevents sliding. So sliding is actually promoted by salt because you break those electrostatic interactions. And so that allows the DNA to slide uh, more on the DNA, it allows the MCMs to slide on the DNA. You were actually to do a footprint with and without yeah. salt. Would you actually see it moving then? Uh, we, so footprinting it turns out to be a bad technique because even in the absence of salt, they move around a lot. What we're doing instead is we're doing single molecule experiments where we fluorescently label the MCM complex and we look at it on a piece of stretched DNA. And you can just see it moving around. And you can see that the, that the rate of its moving is dependent on the salt concentration. Is that okay? I had a question that touches a bit on that about the, the CMG right. activation. Yeah. So at the step where the double hexamer separates, so is it sliding away from one another or is it staying <coughs> bound and then somehow twisting right. to melt? So, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So it, it, in vitro, we can, because we can withhold MCM10, so we can freeze it at that step. Uh, it seems that they just slide apart, the two, uh, the two CMGs. Uh, 
um, and they can go a few hundred base pairs apart, so we can see lots of DNA between the, the two CMGs. This is probably not something that ever happens in vivo because there's a vast excess of MCM10, and there are nucleosomes around the origin, so they probably just come apart and get activated. Um, but I guess you're getting at a slightly different question, which is whether well, there's something about the way the DNA melting. So, so is it the action of them pulling away from each other that sort of untwists the intervening DNA to open it right. up? Right. Uh, I think it's it's sort of like that. Uh, I think the, I think the two things happen together. Well, so in the in the double hexamer, if you look carefully at the structure, what you see is that the two rings are planar. So they're, they're, you know, they're exactly opposite each other like this. But in the CMG, the two rings go into a slight corkscrew configuration. And so I think what happens is that, first of all, the corkscrew is, is incompatible with the double hexamer. So as soon as it, it goes into that thing, it's, it breaks the double hexamer. And then you could imagine that what happens is that, you know, some subunits are holding one strand and another subunit is holding another strand. And all of a sudden now you move those two subunits apart, you're going to stretch the DNA. And that's probably how that initial melting happens. There's some evidence in bacteria that DNA A works that way. Um, so it's probably the switch from the planar to the corkscrew configuration that generates tension on the DNA within the, the double hexamer in the hexamer. Thanks. But we, we, we'd really love to get a high resolution structure of that CMG before it becomes activated. That's something we're working on. One question over here. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I had a question on the epigenomic inheritance during replication. Mm -hmm. uh, I Two questions. One, are there global epigen epigenomic changes during the final stages or synth uh, before synthesis? And the other is, are these, uh, so you also mentioned maybe acetylation is necessary to unwind uh, the DNA? Right. Uh, and okay. yeah, yeah, are these marks then uh, inherited to the re-deposition re uh, of the right. histones? Yeah, so the short answer is I, I don't know the answer to either of those questions, um, but I can speculate a little. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, I don't look at replication as being something that necessarily changes the epigenome, but rather something that is trying very hard to maintain it so that you know it doesn't change. Um, I think you're probably, in the second question, you're referring to the fact that acetylation can make the replication fork go a bit faster. Um, and I think, I don't know how relevant that is. I, I have a suspicion that it's more important than we previously thought it was. Um, and there is, there is one paper that claims that there's a wave of acetylation that, ha that precedes the replication fork. And I think there's something interesting in that. And it may help uh, with replication. I think acetylation probably generally destabilizes a nucleosome, so probably makes it just easier for, for the fork to get through it. Yeah. And I don't know how, rel how important it is in vivo, I should say. And we get pretty good rates even without acetylation, so it, it may or may not be important. Yeah. But actually, John, on that note, um, I had a question. So there, there's claims about um, liquid-liquid phase separation mm -hmm. and histone acetylation. I wonder if, you know, maybe it's a possibility that that liquid, you know, that phase-separated state is facilitating the transfer of, you know, of histones that have come off during replication to deposition after replication. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose one man's liquid phase separation is another man's lots of low affinity Right. Binding <laughs> sites, and yes. I'm I'm in second camp, uh, but I think we'd be saying the same thing. Uh, I think what I mean. I, so what we found now is that there are at least three different proteins that bind to fact, and they're in the reposome, and there are at least four different histone binding sites in the reposome. So my guess is that what's happening is that you've got fact ahead of the replication fork that's helping to disrupt the nucleosome. These things are just being transferred by just low affinity binding reactions behind the fork, being driven by the fact that 
you know, as you keep going, you get another histone pushing in. That's just pushing things back. Um, and it's just lots of low affinity interactions that then end up somehow parsing them into the two strands. And randomly or not, we still don't really know, putting them on leading and lagging strands. So I think it's probably the same kind of thing without invoking phase separation. But I think it's the same idea. Yeah, one quick question about um, the order, the temporal organization of origins. Yep. So I was wondering if you ever tried you know, various origins with your system and see how do they behave, do they act differently? So um, we've spent a lot of time trying to reconstitute the firing program in vitro using mixture, you know, I mean, the idea is pretty simple. You take two plasmids, One's bigger than the other, so you can look at their replication separately. And you put them both in chromatin. Maybe you acetylate one. You don't acetylate the other. You use a different origin, one, the other. You mix them together, and you try and see one replicating before the other one. Uh, we've spent a lot of time trying to do that, and we've not seen it yet. So, you know, we're missing something. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. It's something I'd really love to kind of come come up with some uh, uh, some real understanding of mechanistically. Okay, if there are no further questions, I, I think. I have a oh. <laughs> so do remember Karim uh, had identified a surplus of the MCM? That's right, MCM2. For binding to this term. Yeah. So I wonder if, if this, assuming that surplus is not necessary for the chemistry of this, in your system where you drive <coughs> replication through chromatin using fat. Right. Is this surplus? Right. I mean, this is exactly, so what we're doing now is we're mapping all of the fact interactions. We're going to make mutations in all the reposome components to affect fact binding. We're going to take all the histone binding. So the MCM2 is one of them, but there's also a histone binding site in pol alpha. There's another histone binding site in CTF4, and there's one in pol epsilon. So we're going to try and take each one of these things and start to systematically knock them out so we can try and determine how this thing is working. Yeah. One last question, if I may. Uh, may he? He may. <laughs> so that's the point, so. But <laughs> so you said at the beginning you might mention, if you were asked this question, that there are some differences in replication between the cancer cells. Right. Very briefly. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people working on this, and we're doing some stuff on it as well. Um, one of the, I can tell you one thing that we know is different, and that is that uh, most can't, so something we hadn't really realized, sometimes you have a perspective working on one organism and you realize actually it's a little bit different. So in budding yeast, uh, this MCM loading step happens right at the end of mitosis. It happens really as at the very beginning of G1 phase. It turns out that in mammalian cells, uh, I guess because they've got big genomes and it's more complicated, you get MCM loading happening throughout all of G1 phase. And in fact, in most cell lines that you grow in the lab, uh, they load MCMs right up to the point that they start replicating DNA. And we actually think there might be a connection between those two things. So uh, it turns out that in most cancer cells, there are things, you know, deregulated cyclins or MYC or whatever, they shorten G1 phase. And so it turns out that most cancer cells actually go into S phase with less MCM loaded onto the DNA. And that, what we know is that if we copy that by knocking down MCM loading, we get replicative stress, and it's very similar to what you see when you induce oncogenes. So we think that one thing, at least, that may be happening is you're reducing MCM loading, and that's having an effect on the ensuing replication. But th I, I suspect there's many things going on. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, I think Dr. Berrand would like to make a few concluding comments.
Minister, I just have to say just thank you very much for coming, and we got you a little gift from the University of Montreal. Oh, wow. Something, yeah, something we we hopefully like for you find useful. Is something we talk. You know, one thing people do in Montreal a lot they talk about not politics, they talk about food. Okay. So, so now maybe <laughs> this will food. be oh. this is something about food. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very okay. Much. Thanks for coming. Thanks.